everyone, this is Meir. These days, um, it's pretty quiet at the School for Self-Healing, which gives me time to reflect and to think about the wonderful cases that I had the opportunity to work with. It was so long ago. And I'm so happy that I was able to meet this wonderful woman, a religious woman from Israel. She taught me, and working on her taught me, that what most people think cannot be done, can be done. And illnesses and symptoms, which we all think cannot be overcome, can be overcome. I cared for her a lot, and the result was amazing. I remember when she wrote a letter of recommendation for me that I needed very much when I came to the United States. She wrote, the fact that I write this letter with a pen is like a thousand witnesses because I could not hold a pen before. I don't want to take any more of this story. I want you to hear it and to remind you that in your situation, whether it is poor vision, whether it is spine that hurts all the time, whether it is joints that need to be helped, there is always a way to move forwards. Like the wonderful man that I met yesterday that lost a lot of his peripheral vision. And yet when I worked with him yesterday, a little bit of periphery came back right at the session. I always feel, the question is, can we find the right exercise that works specifically for you? And that's why I wrote my book, Awakening for Self-Healing, with so many exercises. So you can go through them, read them, and see which ones are applicable for you, because you are the person that you need to work with. So listen to this wonderful story. It was so long ago in my life, just when I was 21, and today I'm nearly 65. But I will never forget this story. It happened. I was under a lot of pain, and the triumph was amazing. Sophia, an unprecedented cure. Sophia Geffen was referred to us by another patient named Hannah. The wife of an Orthodox rabbi, Sophia was a teacher for the women of the synagogue. Her husband, a kind and unsophisticated man, had done all he could to make her life easier after she was stricken with multiple sclerosis, and he felt much grief about her illness. He drove her to doctors and helped her with errands and household chores. It was obvious that Sophia was deeply loved and respected by everyone who knew her. The first symptom Sophia had experienced was a lack of sensation in her hands and feet. When she washed dishes, they often slipped out of her hands without her feeling it. Her hands were so lacking in sensation that she didn't even experience numbness. She felt that her hands were immobile and clenched even when they were open. One day when she arrived home after shopping, she realized that she had the same problem with her feet. She had lost her shoes in the street while walking and hadn't even noticed it. Tests at the neurology clinic of her hospital were performed by stabbing her hands and feet with sharp objects to the point of bleeding, and she still felt no pain. The doctors confirmed Sophia's worst fears when they told her she had multiple sclerosis. Sophia was hospitalized and given drugs, but her condition didn't improve and she was released. She and her husband asked her neurologist, Is there anything in the world we can do? He replied kindly, There is nothing medical I know of that will help. Sophia will probably come to me every six months with another attack and will steadily deteriorate. But don't give up, he added with concern. You should pray. There is always hope. From that time on, Sophia was hospitalized every two or three months. Although her attacks gradually decreased in frequency, they increased in severity, and she had no remission or improvement. She was suffering from the chronic, progressive form of multiple sclerosis. Sophia's balance and coordination almost disappeared, and she was on the verge of paralysis. She could no longer perform any tasks that required hand coordination. 
When she was able to walk at all, her walking was slow and heavy. At the most, she could walk only the length of her room. Her doctors told her husband that Sophia had no more than 18 months to live. A discouraging prognosis handed down by a trusted physician may hasten a patient's death. We have become entirely dependent on doctors for information about our own bodies, our diseases, and our hope for recovery. Physicians should use this awesome power carefully to help encourage their patients rather than exacerbate their fears. Patients should not treat a physician's prognosis as the only possible outcome. Sophia's husband and children accompanied her to her first meeting with me, and they were present for our session. Sophia walked in as if her feet were too heavy to lift. She could barely hold herself upright, much less drag herself across the room. Her expression was one of fear, and it seemed to me that this fear was a big part of her difficulty in walking. She seemed to be afraid of each step she took. She would raise one foot barely off the floor, tensing her whole body and face. Then she would throw her entire weight onto that foot and drag the other one after it. After a few steps, she needed to collapse or grab something for support. What she feared most was losing her balance. Without realizing it, she was hardly breathing, and the few breaths she took were through her mouth. Her energy seemed almost non-existent. I helped Sophia onto the table and asked her to lie on her back. Then, with her knees bent and her feet flat on the table, I started to teach her breathing exercises. As is often the case with severely injured or handicapped patients, she needed to learn breathing first. I asked her to inhale deeply and slowly, then to exhale completely and to wait as long as she could, about 20 seconds, before breathing in again, then to repeat the whole process. She did this about 100 times. Sophia soon began to feel her body. She had become completely out of touch with it. The first sensation she experienced was extreme heaviness. She was convinced that the session had helped her, but her husband and children were skeptical. So she decided not to continue treatment. When Hannah heard about this, she visited Sophia repeatedly and finally convinced her to continue treatment with me in earnest. After about two months, Sophia came to my office again. She remembered the exercises I had shown her, and after a couple of weeks of small improvements, she said to me, Meir, this treatment is a great encouragement. I hope the effects are not just psychological, I said. No, I'm feeling much better, she replied, both psychologically and physically, and it gives me hope. After about a month of working with me, it became obvious to everyone that Sophia's state of mind and body was better. Before this, she had wanted to do nothing. Now she wanted to be involved in as many activities as she could. She was more interested in her condition and was willing to devote herself to her recovery. Even her family began to believe that recovery might be possible. Sophia's husband was under a great deal of stress because of her condition. Sometimes when he brought her to see me, I would massage his shoulders and neck. One time, I even stood back to back with him, took hold of his arms, and bent forward until I was holding him off the floor on my back. Sophia was amazed to see this, as he was much taller and heavier than I was. While supporting him this way, I stretched his arms, neck, shoulders, and back by pulling gently on his arms. This released a lot of his tension and he was able to sit and relax as he watched our session. Within two months, Sophia's balance was noticeably better. Although it wasn't consistent or reliable, she tended to fall less. She also had a few hours of relief each day from her constant fatigue. One day, Sophia said, I feel that something wonderful is about to happen to me. She could foresee a great change. Sometimes when patients talk about the improvement they expect, they are engaging in wishful thinking. But once in a while, a patient speaks about an anticipated improvement with conviction based on deep inner knowledge. When Sophia said that a great change for the better would take place in her life, I sensed that she was right. From that time on, Sophia's therapy became entirely different. Danny, Verid, and I were no longer working to give Sophia back her health. We just assisted her. 
the four of us were working together. Within a month, Sophia began to come to our sessions on her own. She was able to get on and off the bus and to walk from the bus stop to our office. Although she still limped, her step was becoming noticeably lighter. Walking didn't tire her nearly as much as it had. She felt a renewed sense of enthusiasm, and she began to take walks every day. Her improvements reaffirmed her hope for a cure. Sophia's coordination was still a big problem. Many simple tasks were difficult for her, and her movements were clumsy and ineffectual. Danny and Vered worked on her until her muscles were relaxed, and I concentrated on giving her exercises. As a result, Sophia's breathing became deeper and more regular, and the increased blood flow allowed her to perform movements that would otherwise have been difficult or even harmful. After a while, Sophia came to understand how she tensed her body. By sometimes experiencing her body as relaxed, she became aware of the difference. She could now work on moving with minimal strain. When we massaged Sophia's feet, it took her half an hour before she could rotate her ankle without tensing her legs, back, chest, and stomach. In a short time, her calf muscles, some of which had been as hard as steel from the tension of overworking, began to loosen. Other calf muscles had deteriorated from being completely unused, and those slowly began to build up. This allowed her to stand more solidly on her feet, but it didn't completely solve her balance problem. At one point, I asked Sophia to stand on one foot. She began to fall over, but I caught her. Over time, we spent hours doing this before she was able to stand on one foot for even a few seconds. Once she accomplished this, she found it a little easier to stay upright on two feet. Danny, Verid, and I also worked on other parts of Sophia's body. Her hip joints were very tight, and this restricted her walking a great deal, so I told her to stand on both feet and rotate her pelvis. Although this is a simple motion for most people, Sophia found it nearly impossible. She swung her hips in jerky, angular motions rather than in circles. Verid, who had a lot of experience with this exercise, showed her how to begin by making small circles and gradually increasing the range of movement. She had Sophia tilt her pelvis forward, backward, right, and left. With time, Sophia learned to feel how much she could tilt without falling. Her balance began to improve, and her hip joints became much looser. She began to feel more confident while walking. Just as Danny, Verid, and I had done, Sophia began to work on herself with an almost fanatic seal. She exercised for hours every day, and she came to see us three times a week. While she lay on the table, one of us would take her arm or leg and gently stretch it, telling her to imagine that the limbs stretched the length of the room and the length of the street, and finally into infinity. We did this with each limb, and she felt as if her body expanded farther every time. As we stretched her limbs, we lengthened the muscles, allowing them to relax. Tense muscles are shorter, and they limit circulation by constricting the blood vessels. This feeling of expansion was relaxing for Sophia, and it made her feel lighter and more open. As she put it, her body seemed to lose its boundaries. The restrictions that tension had imposed on her body seemed to dissolve. The change in Sophia's concept of her body and its abilities led to a change in her concept of herself. Just as her body expanded and became capable of more and more, so did her sense of herself. In less than half a year, Sophia became an entirely different person. She wanted to learn new things, expand her narrow horizons, and change. She was especially eager to learn whatever she could from us. Sophia was a pleasure to work with. When we showed her an exercise that was difficult at first, she would practice it at home and two days later show us that she had mastered it. Our sessions were a mutually beneficial exchange. Although Sophia didn't exhibit any symptoms of damage to her optic nerve, I thought she might be vulnerable to eye problems since these are common to the multiple sclerosis family of diseases. A person can have an inherent tendency toward a problem without showing any symptoms. So rather than wait for the symptom to manifest, I decided to offer preventive therapy. 
I showed her palming, sunning, and other eye exercises. She got headaches after doing them, but I explained that this was common for someone just beginning to do these exercises. The muscular relaxation makes one more aware of previously unnoticed tension around the eyes. This tension, along with increased stimulation of the optic nerve, was partially responsible for her headaches. The headaches, therefore, were a sign that her nerves needed to be stimulated and relaxed, and that it had been a good idea to give her the eye exercises. I showed Sophia how to massage her head and face to relieve the headaches, but there was a lot of work to do to awaken and heal her degenerated optic nerve. It took 18 months before Sophia could do eye exercises daily in comfort. After only six months, most of Sophia's symptoms had disappeared. She and her husband took walks together every evening, and he was more tired than she at the end of a mile. Only one major symptom remained. Sophia still could feel nothing in her hands and feet. I called Dr. Arkin, an associate of Sophia's neurologist, and he said there was nothing that could be done to restore her sensation. He had studied her case, and the damage was in her central nervous system. To the best of my knowledge, he said, there has been no case of multiple sclerosis in which sensation has returned. So please just be grateful for what an excellent job you have done. I was not convinced that Dr. Arkin was right. I felt that if anyone deserved health, it was Sophia. She had worked hard on herself, and she was doing everything she could to get well. I started to rub Sophia's fingers every time she came to see me, putting all my love and faith into each massage. I used hand cream to warm her skin and reduce the friction of massage. Each time I asked her, Can you feel anything now? And she answered, No, not a thing. Finally, in despair, I called Miriam one evening. I described Sophia's condition, and after asking a few questions, Miriam understood the whole picture. She asked me, You know what to do in a case like this, don't you? Would I ask you if I knew? I answered impatiently. Ignoring me, Miriam continued. It's so simple. All you have to do is tell her to tap her fingers on a table. I was astonished. It really was simple. Why hadn't I thought of that? I was certain that Sophia would be able to feel with her hands. I didn't understand the effect such an exercise would have, but it was clear to me that stimulating the nerve endings in this way would influence the central nervous system. Sophia came for her next appointment on a Friday morning, ready to face a hectic day of preparations and then a restful Sabbath. She was surprised when I asked her to sit down at my desk rather than go into the treatment room. Then I sat down beside her. At that moment, my empathy with Sophia was so complete that I experienced a mental union with her. As Miriam suggested, I told Sophia to tap her fingertips on the desktop. She responded without hesitation, tapping quickly and rhythmically. At first this caused her some pain, but the pain diminished after tapping about 50 times, and then it disappeared. After tapping about 100 times, she began to sense pressure in her fingertips. She continued the tapping, and the pressure also gradually disappeared. After she had tapped about 300 times, she felt only numbness. I was doing the exercise with her, and to my astonishment, it was as if I felt each of her feelings in my own body. By the time we reached 700 taps, there was no pain and no pressure, only a continuous feeling of stimulation. I told Sophia to breathe deeply and relax her shoulders so that we could continue the exercise as long as possible. After tapping a thousand times, her hands felt as if they were capable of complete, normal sensation. Then we started to tap the knuckles nearest the fingertips on the desk, and we had the same experience, but it took only half as long to achieve the same results we'd had with the fingertips. We tapped gently at first, slowly increasing the intensity. When the pain came, it was a strong sensation, not numb or distant. Then we repeated the exercise with the middle knuckles, with similar results, with an even greater level of sensation, pressure, and pain. Once the process of awakening had begun, it was almost instantaneous. Finally, we worked on the largest knuckles, 
where the fingers connect to the hand, and it followed the same progression. First she felt numbness, then pain, then painless pressure, then tingling. We continued by tapping on the table with the wrist bones adjacent to the little finger. By this time, Sophia was able to feel everything she touched, and her hands no longer felt clenched and locked as they had for months. They actually felt relaxed. I let Sophia lie down on the table, and I massaged her for a while. Then I began to test her. With her eyes closed, I put a pen in her hand. She was able to identify it by touch. I gave her a pencil, and she identified it as a pencil, not a pen, because she could feel that it was made of wood. I called Danny and Veridin to share in our triumph. I was so happy that I was in tears. Sophia's was the greatest improvement I had ever seen. For Sophia and me, this was the happiest day of our lives. For the next few weeks, we used the same exercise to help restore sensation in Sophia's feet. It took longer to accomplish this than with her fingers. Sophia couldn't raise her legs easily, so we assisted her in tapping with her feet. But after three weeks, she began to feel something in her heels. With a lot of exercise and massage, some, though not all of her feeling, was regained. I called Miriam to tell her about Sophia's success, and she took the news calmly. The results were as she had expected. Then with great excitement, I called Dr. Arkin. He was incredulous and even defensive at first, but soon he was convinced that I was telling the truth. When he saw Sophia a few weeks later, he was amazed. As a result, he began to refer other neurological patients to us. The doctors at Sophia's hospital had a different reaction. When they saw Sophia's vast improvement, they decided that she'd had a remission after all and re-diagnosed her as having the relapsing, remitting form of multiple sclerosis. They overlooked the fact that no multiple sclerosis patient had ever previously been known to experience remission from a prolonged and total lack of sensation. We are not talking about numbness, which is a sensation in itself, but about a total lack of feeling. I cannot claim to have a cure for multiple sclerosis, but I can offer the possibility of health for anyone willing to invest the time and effort. Sophia was such a person. She was determined to cure herself, and she succeeded. She thoroughly earned that cure. Sophia had no preconceptions or prejudices. She didn't approach the matter intellectually. She just proceeded with confidence and trust that something would happen. With such an attitude, any disease can be overcome. <laughs>